You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests each week. And my podcast, podcast rather, is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's also available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and anywhere else you may get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as on a personal note, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as you can see in the background on YouTube, That Gratitude Guy podcast. Dot com as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guests every week. I feel fortunate to have a nice guest that always has a lot to say, which I appreciate so much and no exception this week. Karen Lubin, EDD. Karen is a coach, trainer, and leadership consultant driven by a desire to inspire and energize people and teams through the power of love, self-reflection, and inner leadership. She uses passion, reflective journaling, and connection as the foundational basis to catapult people into a life full of deep meaning connected to soul and purpose. Karen collaborates with transformational mentors who create wisdom journals that support people in transition and recovery to greater greater clarity, self-esteem, and emotional resilience. She uses her seasonal wisdom journals and her quantum wisdom coaching and quantum leap coaching and consulting practices at Dr. Karen, that's K-A-R-I-N, Lubin, L-U-B-I-N dot com. Dr. Karen, Karen, welcome to the podcast. Wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry I, you had to read so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Well, thank you. It's nice to have you. So I always start, start and end my podcast with the same question to people, but I always think it's fun for the context. Tell the listeners how you and I met. Well, that's a really good question because it was kind of at a different kind of angle than I would have normally thought. Uh, somebody had been taking uh, a exercise class that I've been doing uh, three times a week. And she just, I think she said to me, and she just mentioned it casually to you and to somebody else. And you got very interested in this exercise class. And so you reached out and we connected and you're now actually exercising three times a week together with a whole community of other folks who are um, really exercise enthusiasts, you know, Amazons. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, I'm really excited that you're joining. It's very fun. Well, thank you. And as I said to you earlier offline, uh, it's really exciting for me and it's really cool. And I've been on three sessions so far and will continue three days a week. So that is fantastic. And and speaking of how you and I met, I always like to let the viewers and listeners know that just to establish some context. And I think where I live in Seattle, I look out towards Lake Washington, there's a bunch of trees and I see all these trees with all these branches that start with one base uh, foundation and spread out to bigger and bigger and then smaller and smaller branches. And it fascinates me if I told you how Cornelia, who was the person who introduced me to you, how I met her was actually through a woman in Australia that I met through another person that had called me about a podcast and it went and Cornelia and I only live 70 oh, wow. miles apart. It's just how those branches of that tree go out there are uh, uh, just fascinating to me and how you can meet one person that can expand to all these different people. So, And then when I met you, I'm thinking too, like so many people, I'm very fortunate to meet. I go, oh, I love this energy. What a like-minded person. And I use that word probably more than anything else. So, but yeah. let's go back a little bit, speaking of like-minded and talk for, so the viewers and listeners that wouldn't know, and including for my education as well, talk about your journey a little bit, maybe not high school, but high school, college, college on how you got started on this journey that ultimately ended up you having an EDD and where you are today. 
Wow. Well, that's a um, <laughs> that could be a long story. I'm going to make it short. Okay. Mm -hmm. So really, what happened? Uh, let's say about 30 years ago is that I got into education. I was a public school teacher, and I taught every grade, kindergarten through eighth grade, and then I became vice principal. Then I became principal, and then I kept going into uh, more and more administration, and I finally burned out. Mm. Oh boy. So I had been so passionate about education, kids being, you know, just doing this whole, to me, transformational education. And the system started to, to change me. So I, I was kind of uh, a zombie. <laughs> that mm. was not a good thing. Uh, so what I ended up doing is I actually released myself and that was very hard to do because I had had this idea that I would be in education for my entire career. Mm -hmm. So once I was able to step away, I actually filled myself up and I had this huge bucket list of things that I had wanted to do. And I basically traveled for a year and did a number of these things. I went to uh, to India and I studied with these spiritual masters. I went to Belize and learned how to sail. You know, I went to Mexico and learned how to speak some Spanish. And I went, I mean, it was on and on that I did all these classes and courses all throughout the United States and everywhere. And then I came home. One of the things I'd always wanted to do was to uh, really work with my husband. Uh, he was a professor at a university and he also was kind of feeling a need to shift things. So we took the best of our doctorate program. We actually got our doctorates together and it was an educational and organizational leadership. And we took, because there was a lot of focus on mentoring and coaching. And so we actually took that and brought it into and developed our own uh, coaching business. And it's called Quantum Leap Coaching and Consulting. And we've been doing it for over, I don't know, 16, 18 years now. And what I found is that I was looking for a tool that I, I was really just exploring what would be a way to go do a good intake and go deep and not do the superficial thing. So I ended up uh, reading this book called, oh, here it is, The Passion Test. And mm -hmm. uh, I love this book. And it's by Janet and Chris Atwood. And I read it and I went, you know, gosh, this sounds like something that could be a really awesome intake. So I then was, strangely enough, invited to this five-day event, and Janet Bray Atwood was actually presenting. And I thought, oh my God, that's so cool. So we went, um, I totally fell in love with the process. I got very clear. And what I loved is seeing like 400 people and they were of all ages. And I realized that this could impact anyone from you know the age of five to the age of 95. And it was so cool everyone would benefit. And it didn't matter if you're a doctor, a lawyer, someone who is crystal clear, successful, you know, coaching person to someone who is totally unclear. It would still, it would help anyone and everyone. It was very powerful to see. Simple, easy to use. So I just kind of got all, you know, I remember Jana at the end, she's like, how many of you would want to, you know, be doing this and supporting other families and people? And of course, I raised my hand and she's like, go to the back of the room. And I was like, what? OK, so I go to the back of the room and I realized that I was signing up to become a passion <laughs> test facilitator. I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I, I actually thought, you know what, this is a yes. Wow. And I mean, I had looked at my passions and it really was in alignment with my passions. Mm -hmm. And that's like the whole key to this whole process is you're always asking yourself whenever you're faced with a choice, decision or opportunity, then say yes to your passions. That's the key. And so many of us, it's like giving us suddenly, finally permission to say yes to what's important to us. So anyway, that's how I did it. And just a question on that, Karen. On the, the actual book, The Passion Test, you mentioned by Janet Atwood, what's kind of the premise or is it sort of a, a, a in a sense, uh, an assessment that you go through or how is it kind of structured that got you so excited about it? Well, it, it's a very simple structure. So 
uh, you, you're, you come up with a list of 10 things, 10 to 15 items that are most important to you. And, and we're talking about in the present moment. So we're not talking necessarily about what you used to be excited about, but like today. So I love that. And then uh, the person who's facilitating and helping you out facilitates you through uh, these three questions. So they basically get you to do a comparison between two different passions that you have listed and they take you through all 10 or all 15, whatever it is. And then we come up with your five. And from that, those five things that are most important to you at this time, that's what you use as a decision-making tool. And I love that mm -hmm. because now everything is based on these things that are most important to you. Mm -hmm. And do these change? Yes, they change. That's why you have to redo and update yourself every six to, you know, 12 months, or some people do it every three months, or people do it every two weeks, you know, it just depends if it feels, if the passions you're looking at feel really good. For example, I'll read a couple. Is that okay if I read? Yes, absolutely. Mine? Okay, so one of mine is being spiritually rooted in nature and self love practices. Mm -hmm. Another is being super strong, wildly healthy and trim. Mm -hmm. Number three, deeply connected to and spending quality time with those I love. My fourth is I'm a sought after speaker and trainer connecting with powerful leaders who support my work. And the fifth is continuing my learning and expanding in wisdom and higher consciousness. Nice. And, you know, you had mentioned that um, it was important to you that you and your husband wanted to work together and then you got PhDs together and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I would be curious how in any relationship like this, when you both went through the passion test piece, did it help? Did you see an alignment that you both had? I would imagine, but didn't that even maybe strengthen that a bit more by seeing how you're both aligned and figuring out your passions? Well, it was interesting because there was alignment and there was also like me going, oh, okay, this is what's important to, to Randy. And mm -hmm. by saying that and recognizing that I could go, oh, when he wants to do these things and maybe I don't, I can go, yay, that you're living your passions. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, would want to support him. And so would he with me. So there were certain things that we would see were similar and others that were perhaps not, you know, and that was a beautiful thing and to, to be able to feel absolutely 100% supportive of someone else living their passions. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's both and, you know, it's, seeing how you're in alignment and also seeing how you're different and, and celebrating both. Right. And did that now, how long has that been? How long ago since you started with the Atwood book? Mm, uh, wow. I think uh, 14, 15 years, oh, 14, so years definitely, ago, 14 years yeah, ago. Wow. So, wow. It's definitely been a part of, of what you've done. And did that time, I want to talk too about the quantum uh, leap coaching and consulting. Did you use that as part of your curriculum, so to speak? Did that tie into part of how you do your quantum work? Absolutely. I mean, a big part of what I do is I integrate uh, and help people to get that clarity. And that's a big way in which I'm actually like getting to know a person. Because when you are sharing your passions, like I just shared what's most important to me. So you now know mm -hmm. what I'm all about. Right. And that's what I love is that when I'm doing this with clients, then they're telling me what's most important. And I can then figure out a much in a much quicker way, how to support them, maybe see and listen to where there might be uh, limiting beliefs and ways that we can kind of move through so that they can feel like they're getting results, that they're mm -hmm. being able to move through things that they might have felt stuck in before. And, you know, gratitude is actually a very important part of that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, how does that figure into the plan? Well, I always like to start uh, or, you know, with getting a check in with a person looking and we always look at the, the passions, like how we, we talk about scoring passions, but then at the, uh, so scoring passions means how much is the passion showing up in your life? So then, you know, so let's say I put zero, 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 like I'm not doing anything with any of these. Then the next time I meet with a person every month, I'm always kind of like, okay, so how is it now? score your passions. And then I'm getting, they're telling me that there's movement or not. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of every session, I always like to do something about, you know, what are they grateful for? You know, what are they, what are they uh, grateful for? Or what are they seeing as an aha that they're, you know, 
delighted by, you know, so gratitude is a big expansive energy. I always like to end on that. Yeah. And I think that's nice too. And then you mentioned too about wisdom journals. Talk about that. Oh man, we're just happening into everything. So <laughs> okay, so I, I have um, four of these wisdom journals, one for every season. Mm -hmm. And the way I like to say that is that these are uh, thematic journals that are uh, based on nature, which is of all about connecting to your wisdom. And I believe every person has innate wisdom and whether they trust it or not, that's how I can help somebody but I focus every season on a particular theme. So for example, winter was focused on self-love. Why? Because that's the time when you kind of go inward anyway, and you're kind of nurturing underground parts of yourself and what you might want starting off the new year, right? Mm -hmm. And then spring is about um, prosperity and abundance. The way I look at prosperity and abundance is far, bigger than just a financial piece or a material piece. It's about like, what's the, uh, what are you giving and what are you receiving? Because a lot of, at least for some women, I've noticed that some women have a hard time receiving. Mm. So there's a lot about this beautiful dance of giving and receiving, and that's abundance. And that's, you know, the cycle of creativity. It's the cycle of money. It's a cycle of energy giving, you know, supporting and receiving that support. So uh, a lot of what I've done is I've created a structured journal. So these, I, I say at the on the title, it's for busy people and deep thinkers. So mm -hmm. it's not a blank journal. So it's not for everybody, but it's very specific and it guides you. And I did a lot of research around positive psychology, brain-based neuroscience to understand how to really support the left and the right brain. And also, looking at gratitude, the science of gratitude, that was a big one for me. Mm -hmm. And so there's um, a way to help people on um, one page to tap into their right brain. That's the creative feeling place. Mm -hmm. And so the journal's about clarity. And part of it is understanding what's your intention. And then there's always a question of the day that focuses on the theme for that season. Mm. And then there's uh, three questions talking about your feelings, talking about your body sensation. So like asking, how do you feel? What's the body sensation? What is the situation that might've triggered this? And then what is the action that you might wanna take? And then gratitude. Now, a lot of people only think there's, they have one feeling, like, how are you? Good, or how are you? Not so good, right? I mean, that's actually an evaluative word, good bad. Mm -hmm. So trying to help people become more cognizant of what is going on, because the body gives us so much information, right, mm -hmm. David? Yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm, anyway, I'll just tell you very quickly, yes. the other page is mm -hmm. then more about the left brain. And oh. that's the list or mm -hmm. the inspiration or the, you know, like putting down what are the things that you might want to do. It could also if you're not into doing like the list and <laughs> that kind of thing. It's also about what's inspiring you to take action on. Yeah, yeah. And it also could be, you know, mind map. It could be however you wish to um, create that um, focus for yourself using more of your left brain, the linear, right. logical, practical side. Right. So there and you go. I've got a number of questions from that, but I want to back up a second to go back to your comment. Some women have a hard time receiving uh, that's been my experience with women in my life, girlfriends, wives, mothers, aunts, whatever it might be, wherever the role they were playing. What is there a way that can be? Because I've always been fascinated by that. What is it about your just I use the example of uh, the food line at uh, the cafeteria. You know, I don't you don't need to be in the front of the line, but just don't be at the back of the line. You always wait till everybody else has had their food. And so never, there's just nothing but crumbs left for you. I'm not saying you have to be up front. Just don't be at the end, you know, be somewhere in the middle. How do you help women to break through something like that? Because I think that's very common in my experience. Well, when you hear them say something. Mm -hmm. that's when you catch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you ask them, I mean, at least this is what I might do. It depends on what is being said, but I might ask them, you know, first, how did that feel? 
-hmm. You know, what was your experience? Did that, um, do you always uh, allow others? Because see, there's a a number of things that could be happening. One is it's not okay to be, uh, you know, your your job. Culturally, uh, at least in the West, we're told for a lot of women that you're supposed to give and support. Mm -hmm. So there's nowhere in there that says, and you're supposed to receive as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's not in the equation. So you have to ask some questions and then it might just be, um, is it okay to ask? Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of women might say, and again, everyone is different, but someone might say, uh, no, that's scary. Because yeah. why? You know, maybe they were told that um, they needed to be quiet and invisible. Mm-hmm. I mean, men are often told, don't have any needs, be strong, you know, don't don't ask for anything, you know, like pull yourself up and, you know, so there's a lot of very, to me, outdated cultural norms that we have for our genders. And now we're even, you know, trying to break, I think it's time that we break that open to really become humans instead of these defined people that it, it can be very painful. So when you don't have um, a sense that you can ask for something, let alone if someone gives you something, then, oh my gosh, then you owe them something. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's about open-heartedness. I think that's what I have found is if you, see, David, if you were to say, ah, Karen, I would love to offer this to you. You know, I might have to take a deep breath and go, wow, okay, I'm going to stay open to this. Mm-hmm and say, okay, what do you got, you know? And because here's what you're doing. You're saying, I appreciate you, uh, love you, you know, wanna do whatever. And in this moment, I have something and that's a gift. So to me, when I have finally recognized that it's been so heart expanding, you know, it's like, wow, people are loving me in all these different ways. Right, right. No, I think it's really neat. And I think too that something something else you said that I really resonate with is the the what would be called, I guess, for lack of a better term, the typical roles of the male and the female, whether it's through the 50s, I was born in the 50s, 50s, 60s, 70s to now, and it's much different. And I think this idea of like women just want you to just to listen. They don't want you to fix something. They just want you to listen. Well, I think men have picked up on that too. Sometimes I just want you to listen. I don't want you to try to fix it. Just listen and just let me vent for a little bit or what have you. But how those roles have have changed and evolved is kind of cool. It was about 25 right. years ago now, I think, give or take 27 years ago, my wife passed away. And I remember going to a support group a couple of weeks after she passed away. And it was very helpful to me. But first of all, it was about 90% women because men typically pass away first, at least typically it's mm. been that way. But second mm. of all, men, as you said, are told not to express their feelings. Don't be a pussy. Don't be a wimp. Don't be this. Okay. You, know, be, you know, Be strong and be that and play that mm-hmm. role. And you think about how many people have, you know, suicides or depression, things like that, because they weren't told that they could express themselves or bent or feel bad or feel sad or something. So I think that, and then it's interesting to me too, the, the right side versus the left side of the brain too, how that works. And, and, and also on the structured journal, I really like that, as you know, probably know, I have a gratitude journal. That's yes, I do. And, and I call it, I don't call it structured, which is a very good term, but I call it a template. And you follow mm-hmm. that template and you fill it in. So it isn't just blank pl- uh, blank pages. And there's the, you know, the day and the daily number, and then the current events and special occasions, and then what you're grateful for, and then the highlight of your day, very similar to the, the, the question of the day and three other questions and so on. And then gratitude today versus gratitude tomorrow. And then there's a quote at the bottom that relates mm-hmm. to gratitude. So it's really interesting. And, and Uh, talk a little bit about, because I did quite a bit of research on this, coming back to gratitude for a second, just the physical manifestation of gratitude in the body. I've looked at all sorts of research and studies and things and how gratitude can transform somebody. Talk about some of that that you've seen from your perspective. Well, gratitude is massive because one, it uplifts you. I mean, you're inspired. (laughs) It, you know, you feel better. And, and you're, there's a lot that can be seen in the body. I mean, you know, your heart rate goes down, you know, your blood pressure goes down. In essence, uh, you actually uh, relax more. Uh, you have more of an expanded state, if you want to call it that, whatever that feeling is of expansion for you. 
you know, whether it's happiness or a sense of peace or, you know, satisfaction, whatever these words are for people. Uh, but there's this expanded feeling. And, you know, a lot of what I focus on um, with gratitude is being outdoors because mm -hmm. I, I use um metaphors a lot and nature to me is a phenomenal uh, opportunity to um, explore the metaphor of the seasons with what's going on inside of us okay and so also when we go outdoors there are um different um essences and um chemicals that are being uh put out into the planet all the time by pine trees and, you know, different plants. And of course, plants are giving us oxygen and they're taking in the carbon dioxide. So there's this incredible re, uh, reciprocity that I think is also very important. That's that in and out thing. That's that give and take and that receiving and, and giving. But the reciprocity is very important because in the outdoors, in nature, it's not like something just takes and, and or something just gives. It's right. not like that. Right. And so to remember that the sun rises, the sun sets, you know, like there's this movement all the time. Mm -hmm. And we forget that about, you know, who and how we are responding or reacting to things in relationships, yeah. for, you know, in particular. But nature is also a fantastic way to feel gratitude, to feel awe. Something that is bigger than ourselves often can inspire that awe factor, you know, that feeling of, wow. And, you know, that could be spirit, that could be divine intelligence, God, whatever you want to call this. But nature to me is a phenomenal reminder every day for me of um, that I'm this smaller thing in this much larger cosmos yeah and that i find gives me great gratitude that i can be part of this and that there's such this phenomenal creative intelligence that's making things move around and do things and i love seeing the reciprocity that to me has just been such a big gift that's so. neat and i and i think too when you think back to nature being outdoors being in nature and I love the, the symmetry of the plants and the greenery of the world takes in our CO2 and gives us oxygen. It's like this, this reciprocity, as you said, it's kind of a neat deal. And when we think about mood, I remember I was maybe in my mid twenties where it just really kind of occurred to me in college or something about why am I in such a good mood one day and a bad mood the next? And I couldn't trace it to anything. It was just something and it wasn't biorhythms they were talking about at the time and so mm -hmm. forth. But mm -hmm. I typically do a six to eight mile walk every day. And it's, it's not as much in nature as I like, but it does go down to a park about four miles south of me and I walk on this path and then I come back. So it's about eight miles. But I've noticed, no surprise here, that every no matter what kind of mood I'm in, I'm always in a better mood. You just, you yeah. know, always there's that breathing in that oxygen, you're getting out there and the fresh air, and then of course the sun and the vitamin D and that kind of thing, which makes a difference. But, but I, I want your uh, thoughts on something too. I want to jump back a second uh, before we were talking about gratitude too. Is I've always been fascinated with self-esteem, and when you, when I asked you about some women have a hard time receiving, whether it's men or women, and there's ah shucks, and it was just nothing, and people have a hard time taking a compliment, I'll go, Karen, I just, I love your your baked potatoes. Oh yeah, but the meat was overcooked, and I didn't. I go, stop it, don't do right. that. You know, right, just right. just say mm -hmm. thank you, and that's really mm -hmm. nice. But from your research, from your perspective, what what is it about? How does a person increase their self-esteem? Because I've said for years, I don't think you can take a class, self-esteem 101, get an A, and then all of a sudden have high self-esteem. So how do you think a person increases their self-esteem? Well, actually, I think we all start out as little babies mm -hmm. with great self-esteem. Mm. I really do. We're, we're screaming for the food, you know, we're needing things and we're telling everyone what we need. Okay. Right. It's culturally how we are trained in our environment that then kind of starts to, you know, stop us. Mm. Like we're told that's not okay. Or, uh, Hey, uh, put your hands down or, you know, don't jump. You know, I want to see you. I don't want to hear you. Oh, like, yeah. you know, or, you know, there's so many ways that a little child's brain then interprets what is being said. And then, you know, there's that core wounding. Okay, so 
core wounding could be anything like, and I'll just give you an example of myself. When I, my parents uh, at my, um, let's see, I was eight years old, my parents got divorced. And I really, in that moment, thought that somehow, now I was an only child, and I really had this idea because I had been told that I was you know, a special little person. I'd come in, my parents, my mother was older when I was born, 39. So I was kind of like this special little kid. And I thought that I was special because I was, um, I kept them together. We were like this little tripod, you know, three mm -hmm. people. So when they um, said they were going to get a divorce, I thought I wasn't good enough because oh. I couldn't keep them together. My. Isn't that fascinating? And yeah. it's, you know, it wasn't like I had the thought like, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough. I just kind of, everything fell through the floor for me. I just yeah. didn't understand, you know? Yeah. But wow. then, but that's core wounding is what I think is so uh, evident for every person on the planet. We all have something, you know, and whether it's not good enough or not smart enough or not this or not that, whatever it is, uh, you know, I'm invisible. I don't know, whatever that thing might be. That's where you have to start to first say, you know what, I'm tired of feeling like crap. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, then you start to look for what are some of the tools. I mean, I even, let's see, <clears throat> six, seven years ago, uh, I, you know, I'm a master trainer for Janet Bray Atwood. I work with her. I'm her, her director of her passion test programs. I train in the passion test. I train facilitators to be our uh, people to become facilitators. Mm -hmm. And I also now she has a program called the mastery of self-love that was started about six years ago. Mm -hmm. And I took it as a trainer and I thought, whoa, I still have plenty of things to work on. And I think oh. the biggest one was healthy boundaries, mm. just refining. Okay. I'm not saying I didn't have any, but I'm refining and getting more clear that I really am of no service to anybody if I say yes, 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 which was my old mantra, by the way. Wow. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. And then all of a sudden, I'd blow up, you know, and mm -hmm. this is like 30 years ago when I first got married. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I would do. And I realized that actually is what started me on the path of, ooh, I'm not going to last very long if this is how I do right. things <laughs> in a relationship. So I started nonviolent communication with Marshall Rosenberg, and I did a lot of kind of how do I communicate what I'm feeling in a way that uh, I can, I feel like I can do it in a nice way or in a kind way or a respectful way. And I wasn't because before I was just, you know, cussing and saying, you know, not very nice things. So I actually had to, to really look at that. But in six years ago, doing this process of going through four days in, a, in this training, where you can actually become a facilitator of self mastery of self love. Um, I found that I still uh, have some work to do. And it's, you know, it's an ongoing journey, really, David, it's just self love is an ongoing journey. It's not like we get it, and then boom, we're done. <laughs> well, and that's why when I was saying uh, before we started offline that um, I just think it's so nice to live long enough to take advantage of everything you've learned. Like you said, the self mastery love, and you've learned that now to add it to the whole um, uh, passion aspect of the, mm -hmm. that would work. And so, but now you've still got some things to do and it's just neat because yeah. we're always kind of a work in progress. And it, it's just, it's so interesting to me because children are to be seen, not heard. Boy, does that mm -hmm. ring a bell with me? I, again, I was a child of the fifties and sixties and boy, we heard that all the time. You know, yeah. it was you just be quiet, go stand on the corner, don't say a thing. The adults are talking now, and and what a terrible thing to do. And then you could see how it manifested with you when you thought, well, maybe I'm responsible for my parents getting divorced or what have you. And, and it's just, oh gosh. And and but I love that about being healthy and, and sort of starting out as a as a uh, little babies with this great self esteem. And and it, and and it's just fascinating to me because I've always felt, at least just from my personal experience in life with self esteem, is that. 
you know, if I use the one to 10, sometimes a nine or a 10, sometimes a one or a two, you never get self-esteem as high as you want and it stays there. Just so many things impact it. It seems to be kind of like a roller coaster. And yeah. so when it's high, fantastic. But when it's low, you think, well, how do I get there again and go back to, you know, getting my self-esteem where I want it? I had an experience about a year ago where I didn't think I was really heavy. I was two and a quarter, but I, I wanted to lose weight. So I lost 40 pounds and got back to 185. I'm like 190. Wow. 95 right now but but one of the things i hadn't even counted on is my confidence and my self-esteem went so high standing in front of groups talking at 185 90 pounds versus two and a quarter so what you can identify for what that is and it's never one thing but i know there's certain things that together and we talked about your workout program and getting in better shape that increases it, it just is sort of a, a formula of a number of things that i think contribute to that right and i i use this um, five aspects of well-being so you're, you're looking at, you know, the, the physical uh, well-being, which mm -hmm. is what you just talked about with exercise and the weight and all that. Yeah. There's the, uh, the emotional well-being. There's the uh, spiritual. There's the mental. Mm. And then there's kind of the career and uh, work well-being. Right. And, you know, with them, I, I have to say that the mental piece is really important because you know, we have, so here we are, we're these humans and we have feelings and then we have a, a response to it in our mind. And then we respond to it in a certain, we say, oh, you know, oh, that's horrible. Or, oh my God, you know, we have the, these thoughts and they either support us or they take us down. Mm -hmm. So when we have these negative or limiting uh, thoughts, they could either be self you know, imposed thoughts <laughs> where a lot of us have, you know, the inner self critic that can really take, I know it's taken me down, Yeah. you know, and I very much have done, I mean, that's why I do this work, right? You know, we do this work because we need it, yeah. right? So I clearly need it and I love it yeah. because it has given me such a greater capacity to you know not only support myself with my passions and in my understanding of who i am as an authentic being but also i have this resilience that i have developed over the years that you know <clears throat> we're going through so many crazy things so many stresses and i'm stronger than i have ever been wow. both physically emotionally you know spiritually and mentally it's kind of amazing and I don't say that to brag. I say that because I have really taken a lot of time yeah. and, and I take every day like you, you know, to work in the gratitude journal or in, in my case, the wisdom journal. And then there's the exercise. There's like a number of things that we're doing, right? It's not just maybe one little tiny thing. It's like one, many small things that add up. Um, and I think that's super important to really state that how do we build self-esteem? It's doing these things and saying yes right. to these things that are most important to, right. to, to us. Because, you know, today um, or let's say last year or two years ago, I was really into bicycling. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I'm not so excited about bicycling, but I'm yeah. really into hiking and exploring new places. Right. So that it's just a shifted. So I just go with, oh, OK, so bicycling, not so much right now. I mean, I think it'll come back because I did, yeah. I do love it, but it's not as high on my list of things to do. Right. So you just follow that. And that's the big thing is I give myself permission. Like, it's mm -hmm. okay. I know mm -hmm. I have a bike in the garage and I would rather hike and find this new trail and explore this new trail. So that's, I think, a big part of building self-esteem or confidence or self-love, whatever you want to call this. Right. And I think, too, when you mentioned the bicycling, I love whoever invented the term been there, done that. And I think there's just certain things in your life. It's kind of like somebody said, the, what's the line? The friend comes in for a season, a reason, and there's something for a lifetime or there's something like that, different levels of friendships and things. And I think racing hydroplanes and flying airplanes, a lot of things have done. I did that. 
you know, so I don't want to do it anymore. I mean, I did, it was fun. I want to do something different. And so you may go back to biking, but in the meantime, it's hiking and other things, but I just think it's so important to focus on things that you want to try. That's that back to that thing of taking good care of yourself. And I was always fascinated by the five regrets of the dying that, you know, I wish I'd lived a life truer to myself. And I wish I had kept in closer touch with my friends and I wish I had um, not worked so hard, you know, and there's some things like that that are just really instructive people that were interviewed in their nineties about as they look back on their lives, what they maybe know with the benefit, benefit of hindsight. So yeah. well, we're going to wrap up in about five minutes, but I want to ask you a couple other things too uh, that I want to make sure I get in and this is a question I've had for many years but it's it's just uh, I don't know if I've ever gotten a true answer uh, a lot of great attempts at answers if I will but from your perspective I think about I've been flying a lot lately going to, to trips and to talks and and to your point you just too made too Karen this is really good I walk off the stage and then they're clapping and it's a standing ovation or whatever and I don't know if it's more for them or for me because every time I do one of my talks I feel better about gratitude and what I do and how it shapes my life so you're also kind of listening to your own talk if you will or your own mm -hmm. uh, points that you're making and things but in and in, in and out of malls, shopping malls and airports and places where I've seen a lot of people and gosh, people are just not in that great of health. Why do you think people don't take better care of themselves? It's not their well, for one, it might not be their priority. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have a real thing about not wanting to work out like they don't like exercise. Well, you, you know, <laughs> so if that's not their thing. That's not their thing. Yeah. My sense is that there's many layers of inner thoughts that are stopping people from taking better care of themselves. One, culturally, you know, we're supposed to be focused on everybody else. I mean, right. that's kind of how we're trained. Don't think about yourself. That's selfish. Well, selfish, that is like the most negative term we could ever have. That's true. When it's kind of like that oxygen mask. You know, if you don't put the oxygen mask on yourself, how the heck are you going to be able to support, you know, anybody else who might need help if you're like already unconscious and or dead? So, yeah. you know, the, the whole idea is you've got to take care of yourself. And it might look, you know, so David, I can't tell you what you need to do. You're the one who has to figure out what's most important to you so that you can build, you know, confidence and self-esteem and take care of yourself. Right. It might mean walking or it might mean something else. And, you know, I guess what I've realized is uh, I'm not in charge of anybody else. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I got enough to deal with right here. <laughs> it's a good, it's so, a good point. And, but I, you bring up some good points too about, many layers of thought and don't like exercise, not their priority. Those are some good answers. And I think uh, just on the plane last week and they've changed it from put the air mask on yourself first and then help your child to just put your air mask on and assist others. So maybe if they don't have a child, so, but, but it's gotten used way too much, but it's still a great point. And so I tried to use an example of you build a big building. How would you have a good building if you didn't have a good concrete foundation to build right. all the floors and the foundation is you and the floors are all the people that you help and things. And so, yeah. plus I think I something that I try to teach in, in my gratitude coaching and sometimes in some of my workshops is that it's still managing people. I managed a lot of people at Nordstrom and Lowe's and different big stores I ran and then also mm -hmm. raising two sons is I think they both require the same number one skill and that is you have to set a good example. And if you, if you don't set a good example, it's pretty hard to go. I better not see you puffing away, but they're puffing away, you know, and that. <laughs> right. Of, yeah. Yeah. So I think how that, and then I think there's some things that at the, at the risk of being a, a bit sarcastic, it's probably my favorite uh, cliche of all time. You can lead a horse to water. There's only so much you can do. <laughs> you can, you can get the horse to water. If it chooses not to drink or whatever, mm -hmm. there's really not a lot you can do. And I like what you said, I got enough going on, but to make yourself taking good care of yourself. And in your case, your husband and the family and friends that are around you, there's maybe five or six that that's what most people can handle. And then hopefully the rest of the people decide. It's like, I made the comment on the exercise. Once I talked to Cornelia, I just made this. No, 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 this is it. I've just now made a decision. There's no, no discussion. It's three days a week, eight to nine Pacific standard time, you know, and so forth. Forth. And not everybody always has that type of, of mindset. So, and that actually slides me, and this will be my last question, then we'll wrap up. So it's it's also my another one of my favorite questions is that, and you only get to pick one thing, and that is, 
What does Karen know today that she would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped her? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. What would I have liked to have known? I, I think ultimately it would be that it's okay to be me, mm. period. And that I don't have to, you know, so there's a great quote by Byron Katie. I don't know if people know about Byron Katie. She mm -hmm. has done the work. Okay. Um, so she says, you know, God spare me the desire to seek love, appreciation, or approval. Mm. And honestly, that has been, and still is, I mean, I'm to be, I'm a human, <clears throat> you know, I want love, appreciation, and approval. But however, if I knew then that I needed to just be me yeah. <laughs> rather than trying to, uh, you know, do what my mom wanted, do it, what whoever, you know, all these people were saying you should, blah, blah, blah. Yep. That would have saved me so much time. That, that is such a good point. And I, I've, I've thought about that in the past too, about uh, it starts with the person in the mirror. I, I contend that's the most important relationship you ever have. So mm -hmm. the, the, uh, outside influence. It says, Karen, you did a great job. I love your exercise class. It's fine, but you are the cake and my comments are the icing or you're, that's the salary. That's right. and this is the bonus. It's like, mm -hmm. don't get it confused. Start mm -hmm. with the person here. If you feel good, I'm still, somebody said to me recently, it was just, totally. don't you get bothered by such and such that said this about your talk? What, what, what difference does it make? I, I can't go in somebody's head. I mean, if you like it, great. Right? If you don't, it's okay. So anyway, it's just That's right. it's funny. It just to a certain degree, it's important to have that, but keep it in the cake and icing proportion. I think it's good. So, Beautiful. well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And let me tell my listeners a couple of things as we wrap up here, uh, just to remind them. Uh, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe to me a five-star rating if you enjoy what you're listening to. It's always appreciated. And also, I like to mention people as I wrap up the podcast that I know a lot of people are struggling with all sorts of issues and may need additional support. And uh, there's all sorts of things out there, anxiety, depression, jobs, health, family, relationships, things like that. I have a gratitude coaching program that I'm pretty proud of that I have a number of clients with at any one time. And it's something that you can propel you forward and achieve anything that you want to conceive in your mind with a little assistance from your coach to hold you accountable. And it dramatically uh, shortens your learning curve and gets a derailed life back on track. So I offer a 30 minute coaching consultation to offer you some on the spot coaching to see if it, I might be able to help. And if you're interested in that, just text the word coach, C-O-A-C-H to my text number, 206-371-8309. And as I mentioned earlier too, any other information, you can get thatgratitudeguy.com or thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. And actually one final thing, a lot of people like to get my Monday morning minute. I send out a 60 second video gratitude message every Monday morning at six o'clock. And if you're interested in that, go to your text and type in the number 22828 in the number box, that's 22828, five digits. And then in the message box, type in the word gratitude guy, all one word, and that will get you the Monday morning minute. So, so lastly, thank you so much for tuning in both on YouTube and on the Transformation Talk Radio. Remember, until next time, I'm that gratitude guy. Be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.